Can I start by um, also acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and paying my respects uh, to them for their custodianship of this land, their traditions and their cultures, which I believe benefit us all so greatly. Um, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Um, it's great to be here discussing CEDA's research, which of course is a, a fundamental part of CEDA's work. Uh, today I am here to talk about CEDA's latest piece of research, How Unequal Insights in Inequality. But can I start by talking briefly about CEDA's broader research agenda for this year. Through 2018, we are going to be examining community attitudes to economic growth and development and how we can best achieve growth, but also how we can translate growth into meaningful economic development. For CEDA, for two, uh, for CEDA, 2018 is a year when we're going back to first principles in terms of our own purpose, um, that of economic growth and development. After 26 years of uninterrupted economic growth, we want to explore the distinction between growth and the distinction between economic development. Exploring levels of inequality and ensuring that the benefits of growth are being distributed fairly is an important first step. Our agenda to examine economic development in 2018 is therefore not complete without examining this issue. Today I wanted to talk about two things. Firstly, I want to provide an overview of the CEDA research and why we undertook this research. And secondly, I want to discuss what this research shows us uh, and the emerging issues. So to get started, why this research report and why now? Well, since the global financial crisis, talk of inequality has been increasing around the world and in Australia. However, in 2017, inequality became a major focus of political debate. And as I said, not just here in Australia. Globally, a range of eminent experts and institutions were bringing inequality into the centre of the policy debate. There was, for example, Pickett and Wilkinson's The Spirit Level, why more equal societies always do better. Joseph Stiglitz, The Price of Inequality, Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, and new research agendas on inequality and inclusive growth from the IMF and the OECD. Like some of the world's highest profile ec economists and economic institutions, CEDA is concerned that inequality can drive a wedge between those seen to be benefiting from economic growth and those who are not and that this can undermine social cohesion. We're concerned that high and increasing inequality can contribute to adverse societal outcomes, including increased crime and political instability, and that significant inequality and income and employment can weigh on both capital formation, skills formation, and productivity. Conversely, improvements in income, wealth, and the opportunities that underpin them when shared broadly through society, support economic development and proactive economic reform agendas, which are, of course are at the core of what CEDA is all about. CEDA's aim in undertaking this research was to provide analysis of Australia's position from a selection of res researchers and to draw on a range of available material to provide clarity on the issues that we think we should be focusing on. The three main areas we sought to address were what inequality means and how is Australia doing, whether Australians enjoy equality of opportunity and how inequality might change in the future. To start, we wanted to look at inequality from an ethics perspective. Often in the debate around inequality, the focus on the real issue, the inequality of opportunity, is lost. Of course, not all inequality is unfair. That is to say that not all outcomes that are unequal are unfair. But we should seek to ensure that each person is offered as equal a starting point as any other. We know that for a productive, competitive economy, there will always be some level of inequality. But the real question is, have we done enough to ensure equality of opportunity? To use a term coined by Labor leader Mark Latham back in 2004, and later adopted by the Obama administration, have we done enough to deliver the ladders of opportunity? And the answer to that in some areas is clearly no. 
In addition, there are new risks emerging. For some, the rungs on those ladders are missing. For others, they're becoming far, too far apart to reach. But let me go back to some key facts. I noted at the outset that since the global financial crisis, concerns around inequality appear to have grown. Yet measures of income inequality in Australia have not risen since the global financial crisis and by international standards we're doing okay. When looking at inequality, the most commonly cited measure is the Gini coefficient. It ranges from zero to one and the higher the measure, the greater the income inequality. As shown in our report based on ABS data, this measure has fluctuated in Australia since the global financial crisis, but it hasn't increased. And to put that into international context, we rank better than 13 other OECD countries, uh, but worse than 21 others. The trends for wealth and consumption inequality are broadly similar. Now, I don't want to hide the fact that you can see on the chart that income inequality did rise up through to the mid-90s. But interestingly, in the most recent period, when the data shows that inequality has not worsened, it's then that the debate on inequality really seems to have elevated in its intensity. So let's look at this a little differently, and let's look behind that data and look more closely at how the distribution of income has changed. And from this chart, you can see that from the mid-1990s to the mid-2000s, the proportion of households on lower incomes decreased and the proportion on much higher incomes increased. This was a period of very healthy income growth for most house households, but especially so for higher income households. The highest quintile grew by 45% compared to 33% at the lowest quintile. When we look at the period after the global financial crisis, we see that the distribution of household income was stable. It's also important to note that the Melbourne Institute's Household or Lab and Labor Dynamics Survey in Australia, otherwise known as HILDA, shows a different trend to that shown by the ABS. That is that income inequality has been largely the same since that survey began in 2001. Those who are concerned that Australia is becoming less egalitarian may be surprised by those results, but there are of course other significant issues to consider. It's important, I think, that over the period that we're looking at, since 2007-8, income growth has stalled. Average weekly household income, incomes grew by just $27 to just over $1,000 per week over this period. Stagnant wages growth is something highlighted in our report as a significant factor in people feeling as if inequality is on the rise. Another is the increasing income of the top 1% of income earners. There is, for example, clear evidence that the income share of the top 1% of income earners is higher than it has been for some decades. And of course, the different ways to assess and present information on inequality and the importance that the time frames chosen has to the outcome just adds to the complexity and the confusion. To illustrate this, I actually decided to do a quick Google search and see what sort of headlines came up. And these are, the, these are some of the top headlines that came up when I just searched inequality in Australia. The first one, the ABS is wrong. Inequality is getting worse. The second one, the real story on inequality. An article which began with the lines, lies, damn lies, and inequality statistics. And the third one, four things you need to know about inequality. Number one, income inequality is low and decreasing in Australia. To help increase clarity in the future, one of CEDA's recommendations in our report is to add an independent voice to the debate. We've called for the Productivity Commission to undertake a five-yearly review of inequality. The purpose of this would be to monitor overall levels of, in levels of inequality, and of course that's important because we should keep a disciplined eye on and measure the things that are important to us and are important to our society. But also, our intention is that the review should focus on areas where we think more needs to be done, and quite frankly, where more should have been done already. While overall Australia is doing well, there are four areas that we think need to be closely monitored and where we think we need to do better. And they are in regard to educational inequality, postcode inequality, intergenerational inequality, 
and emerging technological inequality. These issues go to the heart of the inequality of opportunity today and inequality of opportunity in the future. Firstly, I'd like to highlight that despite Australia's unbroken run of economic growth, 13% of our population is living beneath the poverty line. Let me just take a moment to repeat that. After 26 years of uninterrupted economic growth, a record amongst developed economies, almost one in seven Australians is living in absolute poverty. Secondly, despite our strong egalitarian fair go culture, there have been suggestions by some that class is now taking greater hold in Australian society. And aspects of our research lend weight to that view. That is to say that where you live, where you go to school, and the education levels of your parents have a significant impact on your future prospects. We will be talking about more of this during our panel discussion, and I've already enjoyed some early conversations with our panellists already, so you're in for a treat. But a few takeaways are worth noting. Let me start with education and postcode inequality, two areas where we should have done better and need to improve. On schools and schooling, we know that there are significant gaps in achievement between students with lower and higher educated parents. Up to four and a half years for writing, in the case of NAPLAN results, for year nine students. And we know that rural schools face significant shortages of teachers, while disadvantaged schools can suffer from having more limited curriculums. The inequality of educational outcomes in Australia is on par with that in the United States, and greater than that of peers that we consider ourselves against, like Canada and the United Kingdom. We need to do better in this space, and the rapid technological changes occurring mean that there could be even greater significance and consequences for our economy if we don't do better and we don't start doing better now. Next, we must also recognise that location plays a big role in equality and inequality. As Patricia Faulkner notes in her chapter in our report, research undertaken for the Jesuit social services and Catholic social services provides compelling evidence of this. In New South Wales, for example, just 37 postcodes, or 6% of all postcodes, account for almost 50% of the greatest disadvantage in that state for indicators such as unemployment, domestic violence, criminal convictions, and disengaged young adults. In Victoria, it's not much better. Just 27% of postcodes, or 4%, account for almost 30% of the greatest disadvantage on indicators such as unemployment, criminal, criminal convictions, disability, child maltreatment and family violence. New South Wales and Victoria are not alone. The other states and territories all have similar results. Again, after two and a half decades of uninterrupted growth, the persistence of this kind of concentrated geographical disadvantage and the lack of progress in reducing it is deeply concerning. We need different approaches, and we need different and substantial types of investment in integrated support at the local level. CEDA's report endorses place-based initiatives, collaboration across sectors, better integration of services and initiative, initiatives, greater pans transparency around spending and impact, and better access to and use of data on disadvantaged populations and communities. Based on the facts around absolute poverty and the adverse cycle of the geography of disadvantage, CEDA also adds its voice to the chorus of those calling for a lift in New Start payments to a more adequate level. Can I now quickly touch on the issue of intergenerational inequality? This is a topic that's attracting a lot of attention and comment, driven by concerns around future jobs and trends in intergenerational wealth including in terms of the implications of housing affordability for younger generations. Professor Peter Whiteford's analysis in our report suggests that the full picture on this at this point in time is mixed. First, he highlights findings from the Luxembourg Income Study that show that the incomes of young Australians grew faster than older households between 1985 and 2010. And you'll see from this slide very clearly 
that Australia was the only country among the eight advanced economies analysed where this was the case. And it's actually interesting, I think, when you look at that chart, that we're the only country for whom that cohort recorded positive growth. However, there's a different story when it comes to wealth. In the last decade, the wealth of, the, of older generations has increased more rapidly. That this has been driven by increasing superannuation wealth as retirement approaches, as well as increasing property wealth. Younger households, on the other hand, have seen declining home ownership and overall indebtedness, and sorry, higher overall indebtedness. For this reason, we draw attention again to CEDA's recommendations from late last year for all governments to address the affordability of housing for young Australians. In particular, this requires reform of planning restrictions and a number of current taxation arrangements, including capital gains taxation. Conclusions that were reinforced by the Productivity Commission in their recent Shifting the Dial report. Finally, let me turn to the issue of technological inequality. There's no doubt that technology is reshaping our world with dramatic implications, including less certainly certainty about future careers and occupations. One area that CEDA's report sought to consider was the nature of work and the potential implications for lifetime inequality. I'm referring specifically to the impact of the gig economy and a future where it seems increasingly likely that individuals will derive income from s several channels and platforms at any point in time. The exponential growth of the gig economy is currently subject to considerable debate. Some estimates suggest that contingent workers make up 1% of the workforce today and that this is growing rapidly. These workers fall outside of common employment arrangements like superannuation. Given the potential for future economic insecurity and retirement income gaps, we have recommended that the government explore the adequacy of superannuation, pensions and savings products for contingent workers. And finally, I've already highlighted several ways in which vulnerability and disadvantage can trigger a lifetime of vulnerability and disadvantage. We need to carefully reflect on the role that technology might play in this context not just in terms of who can access and make productive use of technologies, which of course is fundamental as those with better access to technology are more likely to develop the skills for the jobs of the future, but also how data and in technology might inadvertently reinforce vulnerability and disadvantage. Automated decision making is an area, for instance, that requires careful consideration in this regard. There are no doubt many benefits that flow from this, but if we do not prepare fast enough to manage some of the potential emerging risks, technology could compound issues for those already disadvantaged. Algorithms, for example, are designed to, designed to find trends based on the data that's fed into them. But relying on dominant trends can also result in harmful discrimination. The problem, of course, is that there is a lack of transparency around the algorithm, algorithms themselves the data that goes into them, and their outputs. For this reason, we are recommending that governments and business should develop and adopt ethical principles and guidelines for the use of artificial intelligence data mining uh, algorithms uh, and their output. These should align with internationally accepted principles that are emerging, and Australia should support emerging market mechanisms for peer review and independent scrutiny of algorithmic models. So where does that leave us and where to next? The issues that I've covered present a slice of the detailed work in the report that we are releasing today. However, they are of course central to Australia's future economic development and prosperity. The issues that we've talked about go to the heart of how we choose as a society to translate continuing economic growth into incre increased living standards across a range of dimensions. This will be a strong and continuing focus for CEDA for this year and the years ahead. At our State of the Nation event in Canberra in June, we will release research that we have been conducting on community attitudes to economic growth and to economic development. This research will be the start of a nationwide conversation on economic growth and development that CEDA is undertaking. It will culminate in a major research report uh, released at the end of the year on the purpose of economic growth and development. 
and I envisage that this report will set the foundation for our research agenda for coming years. Our future research agenda will focus on those areas that could make the greatest difference to Australians, to Australia's economic development and to the prosperity of all Australians. We want all Australians to have the opportunity to reach their intellectual and economic potential because that's good for our economy and it's good for our society. We hope that our first research report for 2018 and the subsequent reports planned can help drive policy changes that will contribute to making that reality a little closer. For now, can I urge you to read our report, How Unequal, Insights and Inequality, and I look forward to our panel discussion and all of your fantastic questions after lunch. Thank you very much.